and thank you to Indonesia, the U UK and the Graduate Institute for inviting um, mm -hmm. me as a third speaker from WHO. So I, th I think really where my place on the agenda is to speak a little bit about um, what the situation is from the WHO Secretariat's perspective in terms of pathogen sharing and genetic sequence data sharing, that's this acronym, as well as benefit sharing outside of influenza. It's clearly a, a huge topic. Um, I'm just trying to change the slide. That's what do I point it out? <laughs> there we go. So what I think this is the main message that I was asked to convey is really what happened in COVID-19. Um, and there are many, many uh, people in WHO and, and elsewhere who could speak on this. But I think um, what I can contribute is that um, we were asked um, by happenstance, there was a WHA resolution 7213, where we were asked to collect information about pathogen sharing arrangements, implementation of ABS measures and the public health implications of the Nagoya protocol. Um, and the work for that, um, collecting that information, ha it happened during the pandemic. Um, so we made sure to collect that information and submit it to the report that went to WHA 74. So what we saw was that large scale, rapid, geographically dispersed sharing of SARS-CoV-2 sequences, so the genetic sequence data, has generally occurred during the pandemic. And this platform, GISAID, which um, Wen Ching uh, mentioned, played a major role, and I'll come back to this. Um, but the important point is that GISAID only exists in influenza, RSV, and it was set up in SARS-CoV-2, that this particular platform doesn't exist uh, across all pathogens. In terms of, we must distinguish genetic sequence data sharing from physical, biological, material sharing. And there, um, WHO set up a COVID-19 reference laboratory network. Because this was not an influenza pandemic, we weren't able to um, rely on a global laboratory network, such as the very, very extensive uh, influenza laboratory network. And so this was set up as quickly as we could early in 2020, where over 20 reference laboratories were, uh, came together to provide a reference function, as well as supporting capacity development, focusing on diagnostics for COVID-19. So that from when the first sequences became available in January, the diagnostics became available as, as quickly as we could manage to support um, across the world. Um, in terms of, of benefits, I think it's important to note that there have been some analyses done, and we could share slides um, that have been put together for this um, on this percentage figure of access to vaccines. This is clearly uh, a major focus of interest of, of many. Um, what is clear is that the 10% was not achieved early on in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I think everybody knows that access initially uh, the contracts were negotiated with high income countries. Later on, I can't give you the exact time frame, but the figure that I've seen presented um, by other WHO colleagues is about 3% um, after a, a period during the pandemic with all of the work that we managed to, to put together with the COVAX pillar, we achieved something like um, 3%. So that, that's what we were able to achieve without the benefit of um, the PIP framework applying here. Again, this doesn't want to, am I pointing it at you? Oh, so um, okay, it's that computer, is it? So I'll point over there. Um, just by contrast, to be clear that while the sequence sharing seemed to work reasonably well um, in the context of COVID-19, I think most stakeholders you would talk to would consider the sequence sharing um, story in COVID-19 successful. Um, this is not necessarily the case in other potentially pandemic or, or serious outbreak pathogens. In the Ebola public health emergency of international concern in 2014, this is a graphic from a nature paper that highlighted that there was a point during the, pan the, uh, the public health emergency where at the peak of the cases actually when no Ebola sequences were being shared internationally. And partly because of this, um, WHO did engage in, perhaps you can change the slide if it, it doesn't like me, um, uh, we, we engaged at the technical level in various meetings tr trying to understand what had held up um, sequence sharing in that situation. And the same sorts of questions came up again and again. 
people who were submitting the sequence data that sometimes wondered if somehow there would be adverse repercussions for them by sharing the data more openly. For example, in the context of Ebola, sometimes the sequences um, data was there on local services and was not shared for several months. Another important point is that in depending on the disease area, could you, oh, could you go back? Um, uh, the scientific community is really very heavily involved in generating sequence data and, and a big issue for scientists in low and middle income settings, but in all settings is how will they be acknowledged? So a non-monetary benefit. And so there are concerns about others taking the data, publishing and not uh, acknowledging those that um, generated the data if they haven't had time, as is usually the case in emergency to develop a manuscript. Obviously, uh, questions about access to medical products developed, questions about how the practice aligns with the increasing open science and open data movement, and also what are the implications of the Nagoya Protocol. Next slide. And with our discussions, a number of, of issues really um, have come out and can be grouped into these various areas, capacity development and the ability to generate high quality data for sequences is an overarching theme that comes up, as well as um, these other topics here. And I, I won't go into all of them, but issues about ensuring that the ethical practice is followed, how to be as open as possible, equi equity, of course, fairness, attribution, uh, and other non-monetary benefits, but also things that we maybe hadn't expected. For example, the ease of use of the platform to submit into is something that came up and it was really quite an important concern that if there isn't that different types of platforms that are submit that one can submit into don't necessarily have the same ease of use, support for data curation, um, and these issues around how the timing of, of sharing sequences relate to manuscript publication and, and credit all came up very frequently. Next slide. Just a couple of numbers for you. Uh, something that we did um, is we we just did some research. This was actually done in April of this year to look at the numbers of uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, sequences that were submitted to different platforms. There are essentially two publicly accessible platforms of different models. One is um, the best example is GISAID. It's publicly accessible, but there are certain protections. And another is also publicly accessible, but essentially unrestricted open access. And, and a, the best known example of the latter would be something called the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Consortium, which is a, a federation of uh, GenBank in the USA, European Bioinformatics Institute, and uh, the DNA database of Japan that are all, all linked together. And this latter model has very big benefits for science in that one can download the data and, and conduct many uh, additional analyses um, which can lead to, to, to great scientific progress. When we looked at the numbers, what you see is that all 194 member states have used the, 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 the protected public access model, whereas 104 at that time in April of this year had used the other model. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is if you look at the total numbers, whichever of the models, that's the next slide, whichever ever of the models you look at, as is perhaps not surprising, the vast majority of the submissions are from high income countries. Um, but the difference is if you look at the, so approximately twice as many were submitted into this, into the GISAID model compared to the INSTC model. Um, but if you look at the, the submissions that were not by high income countries, the overwhelming majority was in the, the public access with protections model. So uh, 800,000 or so. Um, and if you do the, the maths there, it works out as about 3.5% that were submitted into the unrestricted open access model and about 100 minus that, 96.5% submitted to the other model with. So th there seems to be a clear indication that the, the non-monetary benefits that are provided in terms of um, clarity about acknowledgement, uh, et cetera, are, are quite important, particularly for submitters from outside of high income countries. That, that's what the data shows. And as I said, this particular model is not available, for example, in Ebola and, and various other diseases at the moment. Another important point is that there are um, other areas where we have very, very extensive global laboratory networks. And as you've seen, between the surveillance and laboratory network is an absolutely essential underpinning of any attempt to move forward with um, pathogen sharing um, and sequence sharing and, 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 and a benefits framework. 
Um, but in some areas, we have a very patchy landscape here. So, for example, in polio, we have 145 national laboratories in a, in a very well established um, arrangement where they have their arrangements for pathogen sharing and, mm. and legal agreements for data sharing. Um, but in our work for the, the WHA 7213, we saw, again, I'm not sure how well appreciated this is, that there are several very large um, pathogen-specific or syndrome-specific laboratory networks um, that WHO and others um, work towards, but it's it's rather variable in different areas. But in HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, measles, rubella related to AMR, uh, and, and we have the high threat uh, pathogens network covering a large number of pandemic, potentially pandemic or, or serious um, outbreak pathogens. All of these have their own networks, but they're they're all different. Um, and then just, I've got three slides here to summarize a survey. Could we, could we, a bit quickly, if you can. Yes, very quickly. I think really the message is that outside of um, influenza and what we saw in COVID, outside of, of influenza and any, any other potential pathogen, there's a patchwork of varying practices and networks with sharing occurring through pre-existing networks. Um, networks often share isolates under terms that define access and benefit sharing, often using material transfer agreements. Different pathogens are treated differently, um, with some considered higher sensitivity than others, and benefit sharing provisions are often focused on non-monetary re returns. This is what we found from the survey, including capacity building, training and information exchanges. Next slide. Um, there was general agreement from respondents um, that newly emerging pathogens have to be shared speedily and that minimizing public health and economic risks um, associated with outbreaks is tied closely to timely pathogen sharing. So there's a general agreement on this, but respondents in general noted that pathogen sharing is easier where bilateral agreements or other longstanding arrangements are already in place between institutions and the researchers know and trust each other. Next slide. I'm very nearly finished. Um, so I think all of this can be summarized by, and this is all wording from the report that was submitted to, to, um, to WHA 74, the fact that there is an absence of a harmonized system across countries outside of influenza. Um, and in some cases, un it's unclear if you're going in from outside what the domestic guidelines are. And these are not restricted to the health sector. They can include other sectors. Um, and we, it's great that we have a talk um, from my colleague from the CBD Secretariat, because I think the more awareness there can be of the Nago Nagoya Protocol, the better, because it, it really seems like there is still a lack of awareness in, in many um, constituencies. Here. Next slide, I think. Just the final point was just, I think this is, is my summary, that in what we're looking for, presumably, is a very efficient um, system like, like we have in some European countries, the the train networks run very well on time, like particularly in Switzerland. But um, for these systems that seem that work very well, um, before they were built, there were these apparently unmovable obstacles in the way which had to be cleared, but it took a while to clear them. And it's only, it's only I think, if we can put these measures in place. And that's why these kind of discussions are so important that we can be sure that um, the system will move smoothly in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm.